Anthony D. Romero was born in the Bronx to Puerto Rican parents. Mr. Romero was the first member of his family to graduate from high school. He received his BA degree from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs in 1987. He received a JD from Stanford University Law School in 1990. He is a member of the New York Bar. He was a Dinkelspiel Scholar at Stanford University, a Kane Scholar at Princeton, and a National Hispanic Scholar at both institutions. Romero started his career at the Rockefeller Foundation, notably leading a foundation review that helped determine future directions in civil rights advocacy. In 1992, Romero began working for the Ford Foundation and was promoted to director after four years, where he facilitated roughly $90 million in grants to civil rights, human rights, and peace projects. In September 2001, Anthony Romero became executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union, the nation's premier defender of civil liberties. Throughout his tenure, the ACLU has pursued aggressive litigation and advocacy, challenging the greatest injustices of our time, pursuing the freedom to marry for same-sex couples, and the elimination of racial disparities within the criminal justice system. Under Romero's direction, the ACLU filed over 400 legal actions against the Trump administration. In 2017, it won a nationwide stay of Trump's Muslim ban in a bit more than 24 hours after it was issued. Throughout the Trump administration, the ACLU won cases that extended anti-discrimination protections to transgender employees and blocked Trump's attempt to distort the U.S. Census by adding an unconstitutional citizenship question. Over the last few years, Romero has overseen the expansion of ACLU's work on state ballot referenda, voter education and turnout, and the launch of an ambitious systemic equality agenda to achieve racial justice. Anthony Romero was named in 2005 one of Time Magazine's 25 Most Influential Hispanics. He received the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement and the Woodrow Wilson Award from Princeton University. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a lovely evening. I've been thrilled to be with you tonight. And I want to thank especially the CCNY Alumni Association for hosting this wonderful event and allowing me to be a part of it. I want to thank Dr. Vincent Boudreau for his remarks and his kind welcoming. With this award, I now have an affiliation with three of the top universities in that ranking, right? So I have, I have all three. My grandmother had a saying that when, you were, when I was a boy, she would say, Antonio, acuérdate que tiene madrina se bautiza. If you have a godmother, you will get baptized. And it was her way of saying to me, like, if you don't have anybody helping you out like I help you out, you're not going to do so well. And my godmother tonight is Yolanda Silvia Escolies, who, who wrote to me and said, if we were able to give you this award, would you please commit to coming? And I said, I would be delighted. And she's been my friend and my dinner date and my champion, my madrina all night. So thank you, Yolanda. You're very special. Um, it's great to be back at City College. I've been here a number of times. And it's great when I ever come back to City College, I think about how far I've come and yet the very short distances I've traveled in my life. In a highly mobile society like the United States, it's odd for me to think of how much of my life has been lived in such a short geographic area, about 10 miles. My family and I grew up in the Bronx, 
And after about nine years, we moved to New Jersey, where I finished up school. I went to college in that state, and then went out west to law school. But the gravitational pull of New York City somehow brought me back. Today, if you want to go from the ACLU office downtown to the Castle Hill projects where I grew up, it can, it can feel like a very short trip. It's only literally you take the four or five train, you transfer on 125th Street, then you take the six to Castle Hill, you walk or you can take the bus down the street to the projects. It takes about an hour and a half. But it's a trip in the other direction that was a harder journey. One that took me from the streets where I saw drugs, where I grew up, where I saw violence in the southeast section of the Bronx. And it took literally decades to go from the projects to the corner office at the ACLU, which is now at the tip of Manhattan. And while New York City and this room, in fact, is crowded with people who have had a similar journey from working class roots, from immigrant experiences, from humble beginnings, to enormous stature and enormous accomplishments, the journey I made is one I never could have taken alone. No one ever does anything meaningful by oneself. And I've been able to accept this award and be where I am today because there were institutions, large and small, public and private, that made it possible for people like me, the kid like me, to grow up and flourish into the man I am now. Now, in today's America, institutions get a bad rap. They're commonly seen as faceless or bureaucratic indifferent, soulless, ineffective. But institutions matter. Bill Bowen, the former president of Princeton, once said, institutions exist to allow us to band together in support of larger purposes. They, per they permit a continuity otherwise impossible to achieve, and they allow a magnification of individual efforts. Now the individual efforts that benefited me were the teachers at the public schools that I attended. They were the social workers who helped me and my family when we struggled. They were like the union workers who took my father's case when he wanted a promotion and was denied it because he was Puerto Rican and dark-skinned and spoke with a very thick accent. It was individuals like those Princeton alums who wrote checks to underwrite minority scholarships. I was a third-year student at Princeton. I had done really well in my grades. And my father had just had a heart attack and he wasn't able to pay the rent. About $300 was the rent at home. And when I knew that we couldn't pay the rent, I went to go see my faculty advisor, Juan Uson, a Hispanic guy, and I said, I'm gonna have to drop out after this semester. He's like, wait a minute, let me look at your transcript. What, what, what do you mean you're gonna drop out? You got straight A's here. You can't drop out. I'm like, I gotta drop out. I gotta put food on the table, I gotta pay the rent. He looked at me incredulously, he said, well, come back to me in a week. How much do you need? I did the quick calculation of what rent was and what would help put food on the table. And I came back a week later. I told him the amount of money that I, that I needed to get through the next year. And he had, a, he had a check made out to me in cash to Anthony Romero for several thousand dollars. I said, this is not a, I said, no, no, I don't want another loan. I got too many loans. <laughs> I said, no, no, it's not a loan. It's a check. It's a check for you to give to your mom and dad 
with the hope and the promise that if they can afford to live, you can afford to come back and finish your studies. And I did. My life was improved. It was made possible. <laughs> My life was made possible because individuals, even strangers, gave of their money to institutions that helped individuals like me. Some individuals toiled in challenging bureaucracies. Some deliberately exposed themselves to the pain and trauma of the people in the communities they were endeavoring to help. And all these individuals, they didn't do it for fame or fortune. They did it because they wanted to make a difference in other people's lives. And that's why I'm especially proud to be a recipient of the Finley Award, because as a because as a supporter of institutions that are historically vital to our society, that is exactly what City College of New York represents. CCNY has been at this for 175 years. You are an anchor in our city, in our communities. You are a beacon of learning and hope amidst the chaos and the ferment of the world outside. You have trained thousands of individuals, some of whom we saw tonight with the award, and yet others who've gone on to flourish and be titans of industry, individuals like Herb Sandler and Leon Levy, who I personally came to know, individuals like Gene Nydick and Colin Powell, who I later came to admire, the young students who I had a chance to talk to on a break, who are tomorrow's future leaders. And I think it's important that CC and I remain that type of institution you've always been, compassionate, vital, diverse, vibrant. And I dare say that your mission is challenged by the environment that we all now find ourselves in. Just three days ago, the Supreme Court heard arguments in a case that will likely give the green light to an assault on one of the very programs that makes institutions like CCNY possible, the assault on affirmative action. And before speaking to supporters of an institution that proudly serves students from 150 countries, I wanted to think long and hard about what I would say to you about affirmative action. I know I'm probably speaking to the choir, but hear me out. Uh, the assault on affirmative action is an assault on the very effectiveness of every single institution that we expect will lead this nation in an increasingly diverse, unsettled, and competitive world. The ACLU, the ACLU champions affirmative action not only because of the opportunities it creates for individuals, although my very presence here receiving that award is proof that affirmative action can do for one person. Affirmative action is about giving every single person the equal opportunity to compete not just because affirmative action is absolutely consistent with the meaning of the 14th Amendment, and in not some fiction of being a colorblind society, but in fact, seeing color and difference and race and ethnicity as a way to level the playing field. But also, we argue in our brief before the Supreme Court that affirmative action is essential to student body diversity. It's a compelling interest to all institutions. The greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action are not the Latino or black students. It's often the white students who get to benefit from a diverse student body, from diverse perspectives. They benefit because of a robust academic debate and inquiry that is in their classrooms. They're exposed to a broader set of ideas 
of experiences, of backgrounds. They're exposed to individuals who will help them chart a course in their life that will be beneficial to them and their families. Now, affirmative action is what allowed me to make that trip from the Castle Hill projects to the corner office at the ACLU. I worked hard every step of the way. I earned my grades. I paid my dues. I had a lot of help from my family and loved ones and colleagues and others. But affirmative action gave me a shot. And that's why I'm unrepentant about being a proud beneficiary of affirmative action. That if I stand here today and I'm honored by you, it is only because you are honoring the efficacy of programs like affirmative action that have leveled the playing field for, for millions of individuals previous to us and future generations as well. We know it's been documented that affirmative action has practical benefits, that diverse teams do better research, they publish better science, they practice better law. Diverse campuses promote equitable access to the professions while preparing students from all walks of life for an increasingly diverse workforce. And I'm not surprised that CCNY that has been living this mission and cultivating generations of students from diverse walks of life finds itself on the top of the three rankings of universities. Because you are proof that in fact your diverse student body is what makes you so highly effective and so important in our nation's landscape. As we all endeavor to achieve individual success in our respective lives and careers, we also have to think about the ways in which our lives and our trajectories are enhanced by the real world experiences of knowing what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes, what it's like to know difference, what it's, not, what it's like to understand a bit of struggle. And affirmative action and the presence of people from diverse walks of life helps make sure that we all are more rounded in our understanding of the human experience. That we can understand what it's like to struggle because we can see the struggle of people around us. And I think we all become better individuals as a result of it. I remain confident that individuals like you, organizations like mine, institutions like CCNY will continue to embrace diversity to build a future in which both poor kids from the Bronx and rich kids from the East Side can come together and flourish and learn and grow. I want to thank you for this enormous honor and privilege. Being a member of the City College of New York community means a great deal to me at a time when we must huddle and find our community, support one another, and chart the way forward. Our future is bright when I look at the room of individuals in this dinner and when I see the students who grace your halls. Our future is bright because we will it so, because we dream it so, and because we build it so. Thank you for that, and thank you for all you do.